Hey there. So today I am chatting with Dr. Leah Lease, also known as the Shameless Psychiatrist. Dr. Lease is a medical doctor who is a double board certified adult and child psychiatrist and a clinical professor at NYU. She has a bustling practice in the Hamptons and works with all different kinds of family arrangements. She has appeared as an expert on ABC, NBC, and CBS and has a popular column in Psychology Today. She has a book coming out in September called No Shame, Real Talk with Your Kids About Sex, Self-Confidence, and Healthy Relationships. So thanks for being here today, Dr. Lise. Oh, I'm thrilled. This is great. I'm ready I, to get started. I love that your, your other nickname is the shameless doctor because I feel like with divorce, the word shame is something that everyone kind of goes through and no one really wants to talk about it. And it's the reason why you feel so lonely in your divorce. So um, can you take a moment and just talk just a little bit about shame or being shameless? Sure. Uh, I came up with the name because I really wanted to think about parenting without shame and uh, trying to address your own shame about your, your sexuality or your choices. Um, and in divorce, I do understand a lot of shame because you feel like you failed. Um, you made this vow and you failed. So therefore you did something wrong and there's a lot of shame and guilt. Um, but I, I call myself the shameless psychiatrist because I, I think that with cognitive reframing, which means to really look at the thoughts that are plaguing you, that's a CB cognitive behavioral therapy term, and reframing them in, and you can address the shame that you're experiencing and create a new way of thinking, which is about, okay, yeah, I might have made a mistake, some things are out of my control, but it was all part of my learning curve or who I am as a human being, you know, and now I can think about this in a more positive light, um, including divorce. Like, you know, it, it's really tough in the beginning and all that, but you can re redefine who you are as a human being and who you want to be. So this looking at the thoughts and the thoughts of shame, you have to address. Mm, so. Yeah, that's so good. And then coming out the other end and not letting that your divorce define you too, right? Because so often people get stuck and that becomes kind of the end of their story. Yes, I agree. Instead of seeing it as a new beginning, which is how you should see it. Um, you know, so many marriages end a divorce. There's a lot to be, you know, there's a lot of books of, you know, Sex at Dawn and other books about whether we're even really meant to be monogamous for life, if that's even a natural state. And I do say some people can do it. Like, obviously there are lots of examples, but for a lot of people, it's very unnatural and it just, they can't make it work. And it's not because they're bad or valuable people, um, but maybe they made the right choice in partner, or maybe they're just not meant to be with one person for their whole life. And if you think of it that way, there's no shame in that. Um, and instead of uh, getting so caught up in that, you just look at it as a re it's, it's time to redefine. Mm. And so that's a great um, point here to talk about life after divorce in dating again, how does someone who has um, maybe have trust issues or is a little scared that they're not going to be able to enter or give themselves fully in a relationship? How do they move on? I think that, you know, the trust issue thing is a really big problem because if you have trust issues, then you're going to put up a lot of guards and boundaries and you're going to be very scared to uh, be intimate with somebody new. I mean, you might be able to be sexually intimate, but you can't actually be, your heart is closed. And so then you don't really develop true intimacy. Um, and that's extremely problematic for a new relationship. It will be the end of a new relationship because one of the cardinal features of a healthy relationship is the ability to be vulnerable. And vulnerability is the sort of, in some ways, the antithesis of shame. You know, it's like owning your, um, owning that you're failable instead of being afraid of it or scared of it. And so being vulnerable is so important. So people trust issues can't be vulnerable. Um, so I was actually just talking about this Kelly Ben Simone yesterday or a couple of days ago on a podcast on a Instagram live. And she said how afraid she is to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I really think that vulnerability is the key to a healthy, successful relationship. So I say like, it's okay if you're vulnerable and that person rejects you because rejection is not the end of the world. 
What you really need to work on is your ability to handle rejection. If you can handle rejection after being vulnerable, then you've got it, right? So what does that say about you? Is it that your ego is so frail that you feel if you'd be rejected, you won't be able to handle it, like your self-esteem? If that's the case, then you need to look at why your self-esteem is so low and get counseling. It, you know, is it, that, um, is it that you may have been really hurt or victimized in the past, not like the average divorce, but maybe possibly you know, seriously sexually victimized, and that's why you're afraid? But whatever those reasons are, um, you need to address them because... Be, you know, you need to be able to be intimate with somebody in dating and you need to be able to be vulnerable and you need to be able to handle it if they decide they're just not into you. And don't take it so personally because maybe you're too tall. Maybe, maybe he doesn't like the way you sneeze or she doesn't like the way you sneeze mm. or maybe, maybe like their ex came back into their life and they, you know, it's, it's not as personal as you think, you know, yeah. it's only if your self-esteem is weak, do you take it personally? There's only one person in this world who can put you down and that's you. And so how does someone work on that? Because usually they come out of a divorce kind of battered. Well, first of all, you got to figure out, you know, maybe you're not quite ready to be dating right away because your self-esteem is battered and you need to actually look to your friends for support and then wait until you're like a little bit, you know, more stable. Like you don't have all these feelings of bitterness you, you've developed more of a even keel. So you don't necessarily need to rush. But then, you know, if at the point you start dating, you're constantly, it's making you feel worse. You're constantly feeling rejected. You can't find the right person because, you know, oh, everybody's, you know, oh, this guy's, this girl's a, you know, this girl's a liar. This girl wants me for my money. This guy, I can't try. You know, if that's the way you're coming out of every relationship, that's really a red flag. Mm. You know, then to me, it's like, no, not everybody is out to get you not you know that's you you're going into it with that lens it's a self-fulfilling prophecy so right. instead of going into like that person wasn't right for me but i really enjoyed my time you know didn't yeah. work out you know and, and so what about the person who says okay i'm ready i'm ready to date i'm ready to be happy again but they're just really nervous about being uh physically intimate with someone after being married to one person for so long it's just you know that that could be anxiety yeah. inducing how do they deal with that um, God, enjoy it. I mean, it's exciting, <laughs> right? It sure is. You know, it's like, you know, the first time you have sex with someone new, man, all those endorphins, adrenaline and all it. I mean, put you in a position to be like, this is going to be, you know, again, cognitive reframing. I'm nervous, but I'm also super excited. It's a chance to go out and buy new underwear, or, you know, maybe you haven't bought underwear in a while or a new right. bra or like, you know, um, think about, it's also a time like, you know, to really think about um, expressing like work, because I talk about this a lot in my book with, with, with teenagers, but also applies to adults, like know exactly what, like not exactly, but when it comes to sex, really communicate what you like. I mean, you've been doing this for a while. If you're divorced, it's not new. Don't be, uh, people think that a lot, a lot of times their partner can read their nonverbal communication. That's always a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, be like, I like this. I don't like this. I just want to kiss on this date because this is new. Go into it saying, you know, I want to have this date and I really like you, but I just want to kiss. Like set up, you know, that ahead of time. Mm. So that way you do not like, they think they're going to get sex and you're like, oh my God, he was so pushy. Well, if you had been very clear, it wouldn't ah. have been a problem. So, you know, don't be afraid to keep, like really state your boundaries. And if you feel like going past those boundaries you originally set, then say it verbally. Like, I know I said, I just wanted to kiss, but you know what I think, I think we could, you know, some heavy petting, you know, like, I think I want to go a little further than I originally said, but if you say, I just want to kiss and somebody does more, you know, then be like, I said, no, you know, and it, so it's like, learn, you know, this is what I tell teenagers too. And it's the same advice, you know, you might need that kissing and that touching and that like petting. And then, you know, you might need to go through the bases to get, you, you know, get reacquainted with your, with right. what this is like. It's a basic right. exposure therapy. If you're scared of a spider, you don't just like put one on your face. You know, <laughs> you watch a video of a spider, then you might like, you know, see one and be able to stay across the room for it. And then you might be able to get a little closer to the spider. Like whatever it is that you fear, you work up to it. <laughs> That's a great analogy. <laughs> sex is like a spider. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying sex is like a spider. But if you're afraid of, okay. you know, if you're afraid, if you're fearful. 
All right, so let's say that this person um, found someone they're connected to, they really are enjoying their company, the sex is great, and now they're ready to take it to the next level, which is introducing the kids. Um, how do they do that? Because there's always that fear that, oh, is it too soon? Um, are, they, are my kids going to get attached to them and it doesn't work out? Do I tell my ex-spouse? Like, what's, where's the roadmap here? Yeah, great question. Um, and I get asked that all the time. Um, okay, so if you feel like you're ready and obviously you've known the person, then um, the first step is, I think, to tell this, the, the ex-spouse because you never want the children to be the conveyor of big messages. Now, it's not up to them. Don't think that it's up to them. If the other person says, you know, no, I'm sorry, you can't introduce, it's not up to you, them. It's, it's your life. You're just informing them you know, mm. so they don't get blindsided. That's it. Okay. Um, so you say something like, I met this person and Bob, and I want to introduce Bob to the kids. Um, it's happening on Friday. And then let, if they want to rant and rave and go crazy, don't even answer. You've done mm. your job. You informed. That's all you have to do. They do not get a say. It's divorce, right? That means right. it's divorce. <laughs> and then after you inform them, which is all I really recommend that you do, then um, you tell the kid, child or children, you know, I have a new friend, you know, we started dating. Don't lie. You know, um, don't say, this is just my friend. You know, say <laughs> we started dating because they're going to walk in on you kissing or something. It's like, they're going to feel right. betrayed, you know? So just be honest. You know, we started dating. If it's a very young kid, you know, you could explain what dating means. I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. and then be like, I really want you to meet this person. Um, so we're going to do blah, blah, blah at this time. Now, a couple of recommendations I make. The first is public space. You know, the first meeting is a public space, playground, museum, restaurant, because you don't want that kid, because that, that partner might have already been in your house, because if you're divorced, you're splitting time. But you don't want that kid to think, oh, this guy already has his chair, his feet up on my leg, you know, mm -hmm. like has his, like, you know, clothes drawer in my house. Like, you don't want the kid to feel like they've been deceived. So public space is first. And then the second meeting, when the when Bob comes into your your home, make sure the kid is like, okay, Bob's coming in your home. Like, you know, where do you want him to sit at dinner? You know, mm. give, and then let you know your child be like, oh, why don't you show Bob your toys? Why don't you show Bob your the your special this your thing your thing? You know, oh, Bob wants to play that new video game with you, and make it like on the child's terms, mm. and so they don't feel like they're already living in a house where they're being, um, you know, they're, they're, this person's taking over and I didn't even know, you know, right. that's not a good feeling. And if you make the ch child feel a part of that, they're more likely to welcome Bob into the, to the family. What if it's a teenager and they're kind of, they're in a moody teenage thing that teens do and they reject this person or they're just a jerk to them? How, how do you Roll respond to that? Rolly eyed teenager, right? Yep. <laughs> um, I would just, you know, obviously you explained to Bob, we're calling now, we're calling this person Bob. <laughs> you explained to Bob that, uh, that, you know, sorry, she's a teenager, you know, and his, Bob will understand. And then, you know, uh, you just ignore or him, mm -hmm. just ignore them, just be like, ignore them. Then after Bob leaves, you would say something like, you know what? Don't make it about Bob. You really hurt my feelings. You knew this person was important to me because I told you, and that hurt my feelings. Like it might not work out between me and Bob, but that hurt my feelings. Like this was, you know, something you hurt me, you know, forget him. He'll be fine. You know, so. Should you introduce this person to your ex-spouse? Because sometimes someone will say, well, I want to meet them first. No, I mean, maybe eventually. Yeah. But why does your ex-spouse get to meet them before your kids get to meet them? That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You're divorced. Right, right. You know, it's not up to that. What is your, and then if your ex-spouse doesn't like them, what? They're going to be like, no, it's, it's your life. You're divorced. Like, you know, yeah, right. they have no right to tell you who you can and cannot date. So I don't think, you know, eventually if you're all like a big family, blah, blended family, yeah, fine. Make some Thanksgiving dinner. That's an ideal goal. But it's not the first step. The first step is, you know, the kids and then 
eventually maybe it's a blended family so so we brought this this person and bob through their dating phase and now meeting the kids and now they're getting married and bob has some kids too and now we're ha talking about a blended family dynamic what challenges are uh, are unique there and what can they do in order to get ahead of any potential issues yes this is the main thing i think the um the the mother and the father let's say who who were married and they're broken up the um the the ex spouse if it's a spouse or whatever mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a spouse it could just be a a, a you know a, they had a baby together the ex spouse would be if the ex spouse wanted to do a favor to their children what the ex spouse would do is support the relationship between bob and you know their spouse because um if she, if he or she, you know if in this case we'll say um he doesn't because bob you know i don't know uh he or she might really damage the whole blended family arrangement so i always say it's like they might the the new person the the new step parent may not do it the way you do they may take the kid to mcdonald's and you're vegan they may you know put a diaper on backwards they may whatever and that's okay because you've got to trust that whoever you are with has enough judgment not to want to hurt your kid. Right. So unless you hear something outrageous, like they got spanked or hurt or something very outrageous, you got to let it go and you got to be supportive because you're going to end up damaging the whole family unit. And if you flip it on a 10, again, cognitive reframing, now the kid has three parents instead of two parents, mm. three parents to offer well, you know, you know, baseball games, and maybe Bob is like an amazing calculus whiz to tutor your kid, or maybe Bob's got like a really cool knows how to fix old car, you know, like that. Now you have three parents helping, and that's right. great, you know. Yeah. And so, you want to support Bob in doing his job as a parent because he's parenting now your children. And even if you don't like him, and even if you got baggage, he's now a parent in this yeah. unit. So, you know, build him up. It, it's it's so great. I love that you said that. So my when I got divorced, um, my both uh, my ex and myself were remarried, and my son made his bar mitzvah a couple of years ago. And I'm not Jewish, and my ex is. And so at his bar mitzvah, we had rows of family and relatives and grandparents. Like there were a lot of extra grandparents mm -hmm. there, but it was so it was really so beautiful because he was able to look out and see all of these people that support him and that's what it was about and it had nothing to do with how whether there was a blood relative or where the relative came from the fact is that there were all these people there and you know i use that as an example for clients too like if you can go to your child's wedding and not have it be a stressor for your child then you've done something right and it's right. really that's what it's about it's a child focus. yeah it's not the family you're born with it's the family you choose hmm. so you can choose to let these people into your life and be and choose to let them have an influence on your child and if if you do so they will be way better off for it you know yeah. even if they don't share your values because your your child isn't stupid they understand that everybody has their own perspective i always right. say this like also about the like the co-parenting thing over divorce like if if your if your daughter lucy is over one house and the bedtime is nine and they have to make their bed in the morning because the stepmom's really strict and they have to eat their broccoli and peas. And then they go to the other parent's house and you know, they're playing video games and blah. It doesn't mean like those rules have to align. They get yeah. that like one house is like this and one house is like that. They don't have to have the same bedtime. And this whole idea that you have to do that is actually just not true. They're really smart enough to know that you know, one house so is like this. And, and that happens all the time in, in yeah. divorce couples. There's always that parent that is a little bit more flexed with the rules. So you're saying that that's not damaging to kids. No, not at all. Mm. No, they adapt. They understand. They're not, you know, this house smells like this. This house, my room looks mm. like this. This house, right. my, you know, this is, this is different. This is that, you know, and they can obey the rules of one house and it doesn't undermine that parent's ability to set rules. And you could have different roles in this house and it doesn't undermine that parent's ability. What's very confusing is if one parent keeps changing the rules, the mm. same parent, that really messes them up because they, then they don't know what the expectations are, but they get that two different parents can have two different sets of rules. Right. And so you say that children thrive in loving and respectful environments. 
um, super easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, but if you're divorced, that becomes a lot more complicated. So how do they do that if you have two parents who really just hate each other? You know, go into the bathroom and scream, you know, scream into the, you know, scream into the mirror or your pillow, or whatever, get therapy. Do not throw the under parent, you know, if you really want to mess up your kids, you'll throw the other parents under the bus. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to mess up your kids, you will say negative things about that parent, you know, parental alienation, you're, you know, in that divorce attorney, um, it's nasty and it, it, it scars kids. And, you know, whether you're doing it, if you're doing it consciously, stop. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it unconsciously with this kind of passive aggressive stuff, um, you know, get help because it is, it is the worst thing you could do to your children. I see right. it, you know, they come to me, they're on my door you know, crying and a mess because mom doesn't like dad and mom's constantly degrading dad or vice versa. And the kid is put in the middle and they're pumping the kid for information about yeah. the other one to use against them. And it is psychologically incredibly damaging. So and what's the long-term impact of a child who has to deal with that? Oh, so many things, drug addiction, you know, turning to marijuana in high school to escape the noise of the parents um, uh, the risk that they'll alienate from both parents when they get older and just not have a close relationship with either because they're just fed up. Um, of course, there's you know, one parent gets favored because the child feels like they need one, so they'll turn against an, uh, the other parent, so they'll turn against the father, not speak to him, or turn against the mother, not speak to them for years. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 just it's not good, so don't do it, no matter how you feel. You know, whether you hate them with every fiber of your being, unless you feel like they're really um, dangerous, right. you've got to let it go. Yeah. Fake it. <laughs> yeah. They don't, they don't need to know how you really feel. No. Right? <laughs> no, don't. That's for your friends and your therapist. Right. That's not for your child. <laughs> and everyone needs a therapist, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're going through a divorce, you probably do. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. Five no, hours. no, it's it's not. And I mean, everyone should have a therapist, at least for a short period of time, if they're going through a divorce, because yeah. they need the support and turning to friends and family um, is, is helpful. But sometimes you need someone else who's a professional. Well, and also like, you know, I don't want to um, undersell your business, which I'm going to do mm -hmm. right now. That's but okay. if, you, if you could get a good family therapist, and you can work out through that, uh, through that, those sessions, you know, the parenting arrangements, Absolutely. the custody arrangements, mm -hmm. you'll save a lot of money. Like Absolutely. I always tell parents the last place, the last person on the planet you want to make decisions about your child is a judge in a court. Yeah. I tell clients that too. It, it's absolutely no one ends up happy that way. And so you do it any other way possible <laughs> aside from that way. Um, yes, exactly. You, you know, you, you know, your kids better than anyone. So yeah. Um, what about, so, you know, entering into a new relationship and it's scary and how do you put your radar up and not make the same mistake twice? Because that's a hard one <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or even like trust your gut, you know, and kind of listen to yourself because I feel like you know, the statistics are really high and staggering out there for second marriages and third marriages. And you know, I, I feel like often people will sort of tuck the red flags under a carpet and say, oh, well, that, that was not a big deal. You know, how do you, how do you pay attention to that voice? Um, I think to really under own your sexual story, and that's something I talk about in my book, No Shame, is like, do the, do the important work of, of owning your sexual story and looking at the choices you made and what you would have done differently writing them down and really going through them because that will show you your patterns of behavior and we'll say, okay, this is, this is don't, let's not let history repeat itself. Right. Um, such as becoming too enmeshed with your partner. Um, things like understanding that you should always have your own money and you should always have your own ability to get out if you need and your own sense of independence and your own friends. Those are all things that will protect you in a relationship. So you got to really look at like how you develop those patterns, those trust issues, you know, uh, if you have sexual issues what those are and if you can own your sexual story, then you will be able to see 
when you're you see the red flags very clearly. Right? And so when you say your sexual story, are we talking just intimacy or are we talking about things outside of that too? I think it's, it's also outside of that. Like, did your, did you grow up in a family where your, your mother or father was cheating mm -hmm. and they are very unhappy? Like they didn't talk, they didn't show affection. You know, even those kinds of things play into how you developed, you know, your patterns of behavior. So really looking into that and saying, maybe you had an abortion that really affect you negatively. And, you know, after that, you didn't want to um, have that happen again with someone you didn't know. So you got into very serious relationships quickly or, you know, I don't know how things might have affected your story, but I, I guess I mean all uh, sexual story is like encompassing your, your love story and your, you know, your birth story of your children, you know, um, your birth story, your sexual history, your, you know, the relationships your parents had, how did you learn about sex? Like, you know, were there any, you know, violent or aggressive episodes that happened in your past that have led you to be afraid or have trust issues um, and really go through all those things and then reframe it and say like, how do I want to spin it positive? Mm. Because with every negative, there's a positive. Even if you got raped or something really horrible, you probably learned from then on how to set better boundaries or not to work, walk down certain streets or you've learned like how to protect yourself better. And that is positive from it. It was a very negative experience, but there's always a way to spin it to say, okay, I got stronger because of it. And now I've learned. So, you know, if you want to prevent, you know, history repeating itself, you got to learn how to spin it and how to watch and how to like take mm. the pearls from any situation. So that's how I think you see the red flags and you're more, you won't repeat them, same mistakes. So, and is developing or creating your sexual story, is there a process to that? I'm sure it's probably in your book, which you'll have, uh, yeah. have to buy the book in order to get yeah. all of it. But can you speak a little bit just about that? Yeah, I think you, you go through a series of questions and then you answer them um, in, you know, in, in, a, in a different way, such, such as things like, um, such as my early memories, um, my early me memories of sexual feeling and sexual play, and then my early memory stories with cognitive reframing, my experiences with puberty, my most positive sexual experiences, my most negative special ex sexual experiences, um, history of my risk-taking behaviors and what I learned oh. from them, um, what are my values around sex in terms of monogamy, honesty, and fidelity. Um, so that's around like, did I cheat on my partner? Did they cheat on me? What did I learn from that? How did that feel? Or, you know, did we have, you know, what am I looking for in the next relationship? Do I want that person to be 100% faithful to me? Are we going to consider an open relationship? Would I forgive them if they um, had an affair? Like what, you know, like really try to figure it out. And if you do that, then you can really relay that to your partner. These are hard questions, though. I mean, some of them, especially going back to like childhood, like mm -hmm. you kind of want to put blinders on and just not even go go there because it's painful or uncomfortable. And so you're asking people to do like really hard work, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's why that's why you ignore the red flags, because mm -hmm. you obviously internalize so much shame from your childhood or you just don't want to think about sex or monogamy or fidelity in any way other than this is the script that we've been handed down. Your, your prince, your princess is going to come. You're yeah. going to be monogamous. You're never going to desire anybody else. That's it. And then you're going to die happy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, you know, and that script, you know, makes you ignore the red flags. You, you know, your husband's cheating, your wife's cheating. You don't even, you're the last one to know. How is that possible? You know, mm -hmm. because all you've internalized all that garbage. Ah, and that's where shame comes from. <laughs> it all yeah. comes back. <laughs> yeah. So um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about your book because, um, so I have a teen, so I'm particularly like, oh, I, I think it I up. need this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh look at that. Um, Here it is. So can you talk just a little bit Thank about you. it? What's, what's it about and what can a reader get from it? So it's called No Shame, Real Talk with Your Kids About Sex, Self-Confidence, and Healthy Relationships. Um, it's not just a sex educational book for parents. It really goes into how, how do you help your child have healthy, positive sexual relationships when they grow up? 
Um, so it's a lot about love, intimacy, connection. And one of the ways I talk about it, you got to own your own sexual story as a parent. So you don't pass down intergenerational trauma. You pass down intergenerational wisdom. I mean, let's say you're a parent who has been divorced or even divorced twice. Like, you know, your kid is not going to believe the whole you get married and then you're happily ever after because it, it's not their experience. So you don't want right. to lie to them about it. You're going to say like, okay, this is what I learned from my first marriage. And this is what I would have done differently. And this is, you know, what I would, you know, this is what I would suggest, you know, if I, so you don't repeat my mistakes that you might think about X, Y, and Z, you know, or, you know, I got married too young. I was only 20. What did I know? Or, you know, whatever it is, like, oh, I got married because I got pregnant. And, you know, if you ever get pregnant, come to me, like, you know, we can talk about like what that means. Maybe you don't need to rush into getting married. Then, you know, I'd help you or, you know, like, so what are the pearls or things you learned that you would want to pa pass down, but not don't traumatize them, you know, by saying <laughs> things like, Oh, you know, it's my, my husband is such a jerk. It's just my first husband. You know, so awful. Like, don't, don't, don't trust men. Like all they want, yeah. you know, whatever. And you're going to just pass down your garbage, right, you know, right. instead pass down the pearls. So that's what uh, a lot of that is about. I and love also, that. I love yeah. that because it's like really a whole, it's not just a birds and the bees book. It's a real holistic approach to, yeah. to talking about that with them. And also in it, I talk a lot about boundaries and not just like, no means no, but like, how do you like, there's comebacks in the book about like, if someone's coming on to you in a way you don't like, what are your comebacks? Like rehearse them with your kid. Ah. So in the, in the moment, they're not like, I'm so awkward. This is so awkward. I don't know what to do. And they keep pushing the hand away, but they don't have the like language skills to be like, you know, for example, you know, I heard this as a teenager, you might as well, like, come on, if you don't do it, I'm going to get blue balls. Right, right, like, right. Yeah. I heard that one as a kid. <laughs> I'm like, already, you know, already prep your kids. But like, I know you can take care of that yourself, you know, <laughs> like have the comeback, yeah. like be ready, you know? Yeah. So, you know, like you can be ready with your, with your boundaries. You can set boundaries. You can stick with them. I talk a lot about like, you know, go into a date knowing where your boundaries already are. So that way expressing them, like what I said. Great. So that way it's clear, you know, and not that many. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't some horrible people that would completely ignore what you say and still assault you that's not the case most of the time it's very unclear boundaries because of drinking right. and all of that and then it's like a date rape situation and those mm -hmm. can be avoided you know if you really know how, what your boundaries are how to communicate wow so good and when does it come out uh september and uh you can uh, look it up on a uh, um uh no shame book.com all right and we can pre-order it Yes, noshamebook.com. All right, yeah. awesome. And how, uh, where else can we find you? Uh, so I have uh, at Shameless Psychiatrist Instagram and uh, Shameless Psychiatrist uh, is my uh, URL on the web. And I have like a bunch of YouTube videos and lots of other fun stuff. And definitely check it out because they're really good. And there's like some really like hot topics on your website too. Like Thank I was you. looking at it and I'm like, ooh, I think I'm blushing. <laughs> I know so it's good yes. stuff. <laughs> I am not afraid, you know, I'm not afraid to go there. And I don't think any of it is fringe. This is no. just the real world. Yeah. Like, you know, there is a lot of stuff in it that we're afraid to talk about that we should be talking about with our kids. Um, you know, and we can't be afraid. We have to just go there. Like fathers are always like, I can't talk to my daughter about sex. Like, I'm like, absolutely you can. And you should be talking to your daughter about pleasure because all, all fathers say the same thing, you know, and I don't want you to get hurt. Please use a condom. They never say like, if it doesn't feel good, if you're not like experiencing pleasure, don't do it anymore. Like oh, there's something yeah. wrong there. Mm -hmm. And that's a, such a powerful message to get from a father. Yeah. I mean, I feel like even mothers don't have those conversations with, with mm -hmm. their daughters about that because that's never what it's about. It's about don't get pregnant. You know? Yeah. Not, yeah. not what, what good can come from it. So that's a great mm -hmm. point too. All right. So thank you so much for being here. Dr. You're welcome. It's so is, fun. Thank you. Uh, nice. This is so good. So we'll have to have you back and keep talking about shame. <laughs> so yes. thank you. Yes. Thank you very much.